Welcome to Mohanraj and Rosenbaum are humans. Marianne Mohanraj being human somewhere else. I am Ben Rosenbaum, also allegedly human, and we have a very large number of humans today, some of whom may be a hive mind. <laughs> I, I, I believe, we, I, I'm thinking of calling this episode Game Q&A with J Dragon and Kel's Kids. <laughs> is that, is that, good? Is that sound right? <laughs> Not wrong. That's so <laughs> accurate. <laughs> there, it's got a very uh, like you know when uh, the Rugrats would sorry not the fuck not the Rugrats uh, the Muppets would have like a, well, like Sesame Street would have like a bunch of the kids on and yeah. like yeah. like yeah or like yeah. that John Mulaney special where there's just like a pile of children yes um, yeah. 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 yes these kids I, are. I think it's, I think it's, yeah. I, I will say they are they're not you're not are, are you kid kids like you're all like you're legal we're adults we are all yeah. legal adults, <laughs> yeah. adults. Yeah. all legal adults yeah. it's, it's just that fully, yeah. just from my perspective as an aged person <laughs> yeah. so to explain this is a spontaneous podcast that we that sort of arose spontaneously because y'all had some questions about games and Kel who's Marianne and our good friend is your teacher and because you guys are making a game yeah we're, which we're we'll talk about we'll <laughs> talk which we're going to dig into and find out all about and uh and you were like you should ask us questions and we were like sure maybe we should put it on the podcast and then we were like wait we don't know that much about producing games so maybe we should have another guest who actually knows the shit about of that <laughs> and we were and like luckily hey, I was Mm -hmm. That's and right. I was Milo's summer camp counselor, so you know. <laughs> yeah. it all were you, out. Wait a minute, were you? Were you weren't Milo's summer camp counselor at the same camp where you, where your counselors were. <laughs> all of the people that I'm super into, yeah, like Mulligan and Master Tag. <laughs> right. yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, exactly. It's... They did a, and they did a, along with Nate, they did a, an actual play of Sleepaway that I heard. Yes. Which is yeah. how I know. Yeah. This is how I know that they yeah, were your camp comes. I heard that actual play. I was like, damn. <laughs> Basically, yeah. I've been, I've been Nepo baby then. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Like third generation Nepo baby. That's amazing. Oh, we are in, in my yeah, household. Yeah. We are, we are very big, like she slash strong female protagonist slash mm -hmm. owl house slash a message from your CEO's fan. So pass that along <laughs> anyway to return to the topic this, this sounds like an awesome camp you guys should like put a plug in for this, whatever this camp is <laughs> oh yeah uh you guys can check out the wayfinder experience it's a mm. it's a larp summer camp uh that appears to also churn out generations of micro celebrities so yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> where stars are born all right so <laughs> sounds good okay so um uh to jump right in well no first we have to finish our digression about about whether you're fully formed humans or not <laughs> mm, yeah <laughs> i think i think maybe the truth about that will come out slowly will come out so yeah it's we'll come out slowly over time i just wanted to say because i because because we said they all count as y'all said y'all count as one guest together mm -hmm. so then there was some speculation about whether that was a hive mind or whether you like because you're prefrontal cortexes weren't fully formed <laughs> and i wanted to call bullshit on that because i don't buy the whole prefrontal cor cortex is fully formed thing because as i was saying people with power always like to talk about the brains of people with less power and why they're inadequate so that's just bullshit i think the thing brains are really... optimized for different things at different ages like it's a lot easier to learn languages when you're five but like it's still just a human brain what were you gonna say <laughs> the thing that's making it really hard, hard i think to dodge the pod people allegations is that mm -hmm. the four of you all have matching backgrounds <laughs> which, uh, you yes. podcast, but each of you has matching background wow. that is gorgeous art by the way Thank but uh, it was each, like clearly from the same theme and it really adds to the feeling amazing of, like, we are yes. before the council is that intentional and is are you is that like yes. a very cleverly designed promotion for the game it, it actually is, is. <laughs> nice these are all some art for the game they're kind of wow. cropped by the zoom backgrounds but you guys are yeah. playing this at a very high level i feel like <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting a lot of thought into it you've arrived at the you've got like a background i feel like i'm interviewing somebody from the mcu it's like this is like a backdrop of your okay i i would <laughs> For a I've while, got like a band and a stack of games in the in my background. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
for a while, I would use seasonally appropriate Yazeba's bed and breakfast art. And then oh, nice. at a certain point, I just got tired of like swapping through to find the right description of the weather outside. <laughs> <laughs> I got really persnickety about like it has to match what's going on outdoors. Right. So I'm really tired of this. Yeah. yeah this is too. our first time doing it, so we haven't reached this with this. Role, like we're tired yeah. yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. So for, I, I, I think a risk of having this many people on the podcast is we're all having so much fun that the audience will have no idea what we're talking about. So let's. Let, <laughs> I I should finish introducing. So Day Dragon wrote a, a few of my games that I really love, including Wander Home and Sleepaway. Not your favorite, so just something I you really I kind of feel like Sleepaway is my favorite belong outside belonging game. Is that weird? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm touched. <laughs> I feel almost a little disloyal to Avery saying that, but Sleepaway adds some really cool mechanics. Like the whole close your eyes and have someone draw a card and be the monster is like the best mechanic. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm I'm really proud of sleep. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, yeah. It's it it's kind of torturous because my first game, and it's like so I keep rereading it and like seeing all its flaws that no one else sees. Yeah. And so yeah. I have to do it kind of that is a really thing that will happen. <laughs> yes. Oh, for sure. It'll happen forever. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, I I, uh, <laughs> I have that experience too. Looking back at old things, being like, oh baby. But um, uh, but uh, that just means that you're growing. That's good. Mm-hmm. So, tell us about. Uh, so you, how about you all go through and introduce yourselves, and then tell us about this game you're making, and we'll jump off from there. Who's going first? I'm gonna call on you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't see what order you are on my screen. <laughs> Catherine, you're okay. first on my screen. Hello, um, I'm Kat. I'm a senior at Champlain College, one of Kel's students, part of the hive mind, if you will. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> that's me. Okay. <laughs> All right. And Alana? Yeah, right? yeah, you are. Um, I'm Alana. I'm a sophomore at Champlain College. Um, I'm also one of Kel's students and uh, working on this game with the rest of them. Um, I'm doing most of the art, if that's a little little nice, tidbit nice. i guess yeah <laughs> roles are good roles are good okay and daniela uh hi i am daniela although i usually go by danny by most i should have asked everybody to say their pronouns let me back up <laughs> we'll do that as a second round jump in daniela keep rolling we'll do it as a second round um, yeah so my name is danny i'm also one of Kel's students i'm a senior at champlain college and uh yeah i'm also helping with this game Awesome. Awesome. Do you also have a, a role specialty in the game? Uh, or a little bit of everything? Uh, I'm not doing any of the art, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And Milo. Hi. Are you saying yeah. that right? Yes, you are. Um, okay. I'm Milo. I'm also a sophomore. I am one of Kel's students, but I deny the hive mind allegations. <laughs> um, that makes it even more suspicious. He's giving us plausible <laughs> deniability. No. There you go. Um, and my camera breaks. <laughs> cool. All right. I am he, him. Pronouns, everybody. Oh, sorry. We're Catherine. We'll just rapid fire. Same order. Catherine. She, her pronouns. Alana. Uh, she, they pronouns. Daniela. Milo. He, they pronouns. What is hey. my spectrum? Oh, what? Oh, oh, God, those things? Um, I'm sure I've got some lying around. Don't worry. I can, I can go. I got some at the back if you need them. Um, <laughs> some pronouns, like a, a, on a palette? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> More like in, like, a dusty, like in a dusty closet, you know? In like a dusty you closet. Put, like, the, Pull the, some like, out. The clothes that you looked great in, like uh, you know, like for like you know, you went, like you wore them out to parties and stuff. Yeah, like, oh, these are good. Let me just put them with the jewelry, and then like years later, you're like, oh god, do I even still? Well, there fit they in are. These? Right, right, right. And there are like, oh yeah, god. like this is hand me downs. There's designer pronouns. There's mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> my pronouns are all hand. now. They've been like, beaten. there's like I've had to like keep mothballs with them, and even then, like there's been multiple sets that just got completely ruined. You yeah, know? yeah. It's hard pronoun maintenance. Okay, so <laughs> tell us about Hollyhock. Yeah, is that what okay. it's called? It is called that. Um, nice. Hollyhock. <laughs> well, it's a tabletop 
tabletop role playing game. Um, it's centered around a sort of competition of trickery that's being hosted within the world of the Fae. Um, so the players are taking on the roles of various Fae, competing, competing, quote unquote, participating for whatever their motivations may be in this festival. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a GMless game. Um, it's like three to six players. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's the basic pitch, I guess. <laughs> the the game is at least tangentially uh, taken from the belong outside belonging system, which is why it's so okay. wonderful that uh, we have been able to get you guys both on in this. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so for those who don't know, in case the audience doesn't know, Belong Outside Belonging is a bunch of games that are based on uh, originally Dream Avery Alder's Dream Askew, and then I hacked that as Dream Apart, and we published those together. And in what I thought at the time was kind of like a cute gimmick for filling out the pages to make it a full book, we posited <laughs> the idea that perhaps somebody might want to make, use the same system and like make other games. And I was like, yeah, that'll never happen. But in fact, <laughs> come to find out, a lot of people made games, including Jay, who Sleep Away and Wonder Woman are both belonging outside belonging. I am maybe potentially the person who's written the most belonging outside belonging. I that think could be possibly true. Uh, yeah, Riley Rethel might give working. you a run for your money. I feel like that's <laughs> maybe that's the neck true. and neck. That's I don't know. True. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, yeah. Also, certainly the most <laughs> successful, <laughs> like marketing <laughs> dollar wise, Wonder Home is true. definitely is the true. most, Wonder the biggest grossing uh belong out belong. that that is the that is the avengers end game of <laughs> or perhaps i don't know That's what's you know it's like the breakout hit it's well yeah yeah actually well yeah i don't know if this is less cruel but if it was pbta it would be dungeon world i don't know it's like the that, is, that is crueler that is actually cruel. That is yeah. more cruel <laughs> i would rather be compared to the MCU only in terms of the dollar figure that's all i mean all right anyway it's also i mean it is also it is also similar to dungeon world insofar in that like a lot of the core philosophy of uh, mm -hmm. belong outside belonging is not present in wander home or at least hmm. in terms of like structural design so like hmm. interesting they're like i debated whether or not even calling it bob because it's like i don't know there's like a lot of things like idle dreaming that are i don't want to like get into the weeds too huh. hard but like i, I would love I, to hear about that I just, but yeah it's in some ways it's it's like structurally it's in some ways it's very similar but in other ways i'm like i feel like it's it's a little like uh it's it's a little baby's first belonging outside belonging in some design. Hmm. So, um, Interesting. Well, I was going to say, I mean, it, uh, huh, that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is like <laughs> depart, like the, the risk of declaring a name for a thing, like these are X, Y mm -hmm. games is that people will sort of um, imitate by rote and not, think freshly mm -hmm. about things so kind of like yes. if it violates all the core conceits of belonging outside belonging that sounds very belonging outside belonging anyway <laughs> that is, that's a very good point that's actually a really that's a really good point yeah uh, like it's really fun to have created a, a, a phrase thing that's like a thing but like the last thing you'd want is that people stop making up their own set because yeah. it has a name right like so whatever mm -hmm. it's a genealogical relationship not a not a yeah that's set uh, of that's criteria yeah Wander home to me is definitely belonging outside belonging, but like in a in a child descended from kind of way. I think uh -huh, like yeah, like it's got the same parts, but philosophically there's something different happening under the hood. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yes, it's, it's uh huh. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I was gonna say it's uh, it's belong outside belong, but Gazeva's bed and breakfast is under the hood, which doesn't mean anything because uh, it's not out yet. But it's, well, it's, I I've, like, I've seen the ad like again, so it does mean something. <laughs> yeah, you know, like a month go back and be like, wow, that's so true, Jay. What an insightful yeah. description. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're listening to this podcast in the future, after having played Gazeva's bed and breakfast, you'll be like, oh yeah. So Hollyhock. <laughs> Tell us how it's similar to other. Oh, I'm just gonna rip off another podcast. So how is this different from plus one forward? <laughs> how is this different from Dream Askew? <laughs> okay, I can I can answer this. I'm I'm the yeah. big mechanics nerd here. Nice. Um, okay, so uh, we've taken like in sort of the same way. It is very it's similar but also different in in, in weird ways. So we've taken a lot we really like the token um like the building and giving away tokens but we wanted mm -hmm. to like 
dig more into that mechanically. So the, the biggest thing we've done is that we've taken the tokens and replaced them with playing cards in a hand. Um, oh. And so uh-huh. basically every player has a hand of cards that they build and give away with strong and weak moves. Um, mm-hmm. And then over the course of the game and by the end of the game, you are sort of trying to construct your hand in a way that's best for you. Oh, wow. That's um, really cool. So yeah, there's a, like so, a long running metagame of which tokens yeah, you acquire as it were. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And we've assigned all of strategy. the <laughs> we've assigned all of the nice. suits of the deck of cards to different seasons, which you can see on yeah. backgrounds. Um, oh yeah. Oh and, now I get yeah, it. That's why it's cup swords. Uh, <laughs> and what are the other two? Wands and wands and pentacles. They uh, that, currently who's are assigned pentacles to and whose wands? Uh, I have to move out of the way so I can see. <laughs> right now, they're they're just uh, yeah. hearts, spades, uh, diamonds, clubs. There's um, a little oh, okay. spade in the handle of the sword oh, yeah. that is cut off by the Well, that zoom. makes sense, though, because that <laughs> is sort of spades are swords and cups are, are hearts, so you're kind of doing both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, That's yeah, and so each character is assigned to an order uh, and a season, and you are trying to sort of build hands that are related to what you're strong in and what you are mm. like the things you have connections with uh, in order to pull off your final goals at the end of each uh, act. interesting and that sort of works with the fey theme it's sort yeah. of like they're kind of very both connected to seasons and also like competing with what there's this like yes. meta yeah. competition scheming <laughs> fairy kind of thing going yeah, on yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> nice and what are the and so are there playbooks in the same kind of way or tell us a little about those um we have eight playbooks right now Uh um there's sort of two that are sort of more aligned with each season um so like the ones aligned with winter are uh the aristocrat and the cursed um Mm. so those have Mm -hmm. some fun like the aristocrat is maybe better at like social social politics and has like a higher social standing and then like the cursed has some magical thing that they're dealing with that might be harmful to them or might be very helpful in some situations and they sort of are more aligned with the ethos of uh, this particular season just Mm -hmm. as an example yeah yeah makes sense and two other two other questions one is so are there setting elements and that kind of thing as well like is that similar mechanically or we've pulled back a little bit and what we're what we've done is we've made um each like session that you're Mm -hmm. meant to be played it's a two to four hour session that we're calling Mm -hmm. an act um Mm -hmm. and each act is based in some sort of event that's going on in the festival um Uh and so instead of having like a bunch of different setting elements that you pull from you're focusing on a single one for each session that you play Mm -hmm. Um, and does that mean somebody's sort of responsible for that element that session or is it shared it's it's shared mostly, but it'll generally be one person will present the idea for the session, and then mm-hmm. as a collective, all the players will build it out into something that they all want to play in. Um, cool. And yeah, so uh, it's based on that, and then obviously there's different, you know, non-player characters that everyone collectively plays as, uh, yeah. and there are different, you know, locations and things that are happening in the world that everyone, you know, takes turns handing off. And I have one last question, I think, and then, uh, um, and then we'll go to the next phase, which is, what are when you say it's, so it's competition in Fairyland? What are sort of touchdown genre touchdowns are like? What what do we, what are we what works influence it or what are you imagining? You know the way that like the way that like um, uh, Apocalypse World is really like Mad Max Fury Road or, you know, <laughs> yeah. or yeah. Drew Hart is pretty much like Gentle <laughs> meets Fiddler on the Roof meets, you know, the Talmud. Like, what are the, what are the, uh, the touchstones? Well, our sort of like framing device as opposed, you know how like Monster of the Week is framed as like a TV show? Mm-hmm. Um, well, Hollyhock is fl- framed as like a stage play sort of. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. sort of like the general vibe. Um, and then the tone of it is sort of like, we describe it as like a sliding scale between comedy and like intrigue. So like uh-huh. some people might want to be more silly with it and some people might yeah. want to have more like drama and politics mm-hmm. and it like very much caters to both and is possible to do both those things um, to whichever degrees each player wants. Got it. I'm getting sort of Midsummer Night's Dream vibes. That, yeah, that's very, yeah, totally. <laughs> our, our thought is, you know, whatever, if you want to go into more comedy, you want to go into more tragedy, whatever it is, yeah. 
have one person deliver a, sol- a soliloquy at, at least <laughs> once during the sure. and we'll be happy. Nice. <laughs> um, first off, I love this so much. I just want to say, like, it's just such a, it's such a good, like, this is the sort of thing that, like, I... I wish I could. <laughs> that must be an awful audio noise. <laughs> it was very clear. It was very expressive. Came right across. I'm devouring your game. <laughs> yes, yes. Adder devouring his games. Um, <laughs> um, but no, it's this is absolutely like fantastic and really interesting. It's a really cool take on VOB. And like, I'm really, I have a soft spot for like, games about fairies and the- theatrical performance and like one of my favorite rpgs kind of plays in a in a in a similar conceptual zone although mechanically is very different um and uh i love that stuff just always um and which this one is are you so... <clears throat> Call, go, feel free to shout out who are you are you thinking of the oh, under hollow hills by the oh yeah that's what i was gonna say the, have you guys played i was gonna mention game. that too have you guys yeah, mentioned it's, played it's, under hollow hills i haven't but i have looked over it uh, yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's it's different it's very different from what you're doing i think in like it it i think leans a little like it leans harder on some different parts of fairy and like mm-hmm. like conceptually it approaches things very differently but uh i think it's like a cool piece in conversation with this yeah um, i don't like, i don't i tend to like avoid bringing up games that remind me of other games but you know i wanted to just acknowledge its differences mainly um, but the other thing I wanted to just quickly mention is that we have inadvertently recreated Shark Tank for RPGs in this moment. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. That turns out. <laughs> that's so we're, we're looking for, uh, for $400,000. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Look under your seats. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. So you guys, we originally organized this talk because y'all had questions. So let's let's let you know that the you're at. Just tell, tell us what stage you're at and what you're thinking and and how how it came up. I mean, you you, you talked to Kel and Kel said, "Oh, you oughta you oughta ask Ben and Marianne." T- tell us how that all transpired and and where you're at and what you're thinking about. Kat, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, so basically, last semester, we wrote and basically completed the game at, at its like first draft, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the game's written, the game is playable, and we're currently playtesting. So we're building a community in Discord um, to sort of like get people aware of the game, uh, you know, some friends from other, other groups that we game with. Um, and having them play test the game. Our first play test se- session was actually yesterday. Yeah. Uh, Alana hosted. Wow. Um, <laughs> nice. And so that's what we're at. Uh, we're sort of having our eye on publishing in the next few months, having our eye on some festivals that we're looking at, um, and sort of trying to iterate on the initial draft that we made um, based on that play testing feedback so that we can mm-hmm. get to the point of publishing. Amazing. So, yeah. so tell us your questions. Uh, we have a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the whole document. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Our, um. our, our, our first question on the doc is uh, how question mark question mark help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up, you know. <laughs> Excellent. Cool, yeah. Excellent question. Nicely framed. Mm-hmm. Very um, specific. Yeah. Where should we start? Yeah. Our questions are not in yeah. order, so <laughs> okay. Um, I think um, to answer your first one, uh, <laughs> I might I might say um, 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 uh, cautiously and compassionately to yourselves. I think would be maybe my. <laughs> That's the how. <laughs> if you have, more, if you have more detailed questions, I'll give more detailed yes, the, the answer. To, the answer to help is sure. <laughs> so we've answered the first two questions. <laughs> Great. Great. Right. We're on the right track. Good. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. I guess we could maybe start with. Um, 
I guess just the first question that's not how help um, <laughs> is uh, when you were publishing your first TTRPG, what were some of the hurdles you faced um, or some of the moments that you like were not prepared for that you had to uh, overcome? <laughs> mm -hmm. That is a great question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to mostly yeah. defer to Jay. I'll just say, I'll just answer it, but really Jay has to answer it because my, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I mean, I've been a fiction author for a long time, but my entire experience of writing games falls into either essentially writing games, playtesting with friends and wondering if I should publish them or riding the coattails of like <laughs> a major TTRPG star into accidentally having a debut game be a hit. So I don't know. <laughs> I just did whatever, do whatever Avery says was my algorithm, which is not applicable here. Jay, you. <laughs> right. uh, as someone who's also gotten a lot of advice from Avery, I do think do what Avery says is not a bad <laughs> that math. Is, that is an sure. excellent, um, it, yes. If if you can if you can make the long trek to the frozen wasteland of Canada to get her advice, um, but I do think um, I think the the big thing is that um, if you are self publishing, which like it is not the only way to get a game out into the world, but it is by far like I think uh, the most likely way to. Um, uh, you are going to, you are going to, you are always going to face hurdles. You will like, you, there will always be moments uh, where like that you could not have anticipated for where your inexperience made you trip over something. That's why my answer was compassionately was because you will like, like literally no matter what advice we give you for the next hour and a half, you will still go out there, put it out there and then make it, mess something up and then be like <laughs> how can we be such fools and it's like literally everyone does every single time my hurdles will only if when i tell you my hurdles that will only let you know the ones you avoid like to avoid and then you'll make different hurdles right it's like it's a <laughs> part of the process that like this is what happens when you are you know doing something totally new and ambitious and crazy for the first time which is what putting a game out into the world is like it's like a it's it feels kind of like a heist it's like a or like a uh, like making some big explosive I don't know like doing some impossible thing and it's like you you know you'll you'll mess up in new and exciting ways that no one could have ever imagined. <laughs> um, it always um, helps to hum the Mission Impossible theme song while. Yes, I always I always joke. Like, <laughs> when in doubt, bum bum ba dum bum. Sorry. I always feel like it's uh it's where I'm I'm getting all these people's money and in exchange I'm giving them this cruddy book so like you know the 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 genius heist. Um, the, the, you know, leaving behind the yeah. calling card, but it's a copy of the book for everyone. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but um, I think that, um, like, generally, the biggest piece of advice, like the biggest, like, kind of broad scope things that aren't just like very specific, like you know, like little things that won't matter much until you're in the weeds of it. But the big broad scope advice I can give is keep it modest um like don't don't promise anything more than what you've already made like don't commit to making a bunch of things you're not in a spot to make um think about what resources you have to sell and move those um you know maybe like like keep it keep it small keep it like keep it keep it modest i think it's the big thing and um like keep it solid where it's like you're making something that you can rely that like you hope you can continue making for many years from now and those two kind of like that as your grounding where it's like this is not going to be avatar legends right like in no world right like as as cool as this game is nothing anyone any of us will ever make will probably be avatar legend size um but what you are trying to make is Ultimately, you are trying to make a book or a PDF or a, a card game or whatever the, the physical object is. You're trying to make you know, the book, and you are trying to be able to make sure you can make that book for a long time from now. And those two, those two goals will generally like lead you in a very good direction when like having to make choices, right? Like, oh, should we go for this thing? Well, does it help us make the book? Does it help us make the book a long time from now? 
And if it doesn't, then like it's extraneous and like extraneous things can be fun and good, but also that kind of really simple core, I think can, can keep you from getting caught up in um, like, I don't know, full color tarot decks as a stretch goal or like every person who backs gets their own special character that I will type up or I will run games for everyone. You know, like those sorts of things that are quick pathways to ruin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, one thing that I will report from the dream of, part of Dream of Skew is that in thinking about stretch goals, so there's two things we did as stretch goals that I think, or not, I don't know what were stretch goals and what was, but whatever, reward tiers and stretch goals, I guess I'm conflating them. Um, but one one thing, I, I, I saw this philosophy in action because it, yeah, as I said, I was just doing whatever Avery said, but Avery clearly, uh, really knew what he was doing in this regard. So one thing we did was reach out to, I mean, one resource that we had was we knew a lot of, I knew a lot of, uh, you know, and every knew a lot of like game designers, authors, you know, various people who, you know, did were busy, didn't have much time, but might want to like play for a minute. And so we had this very bite-sized, like one page, no mechanics really, just like a bit of flavor and extra structure for the, for the thing. Um, and that was actually done as a separate, like as outlier. So it was actually a separate thing that shipped separately from Dream Apart, Dream Askew. So it was very like, if it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Didn't impact the production of the main thing. And they, that was very much like a, hey, you want to do this thing? We'll, it'll, it's like, we're looking for one page. We'll pay you a hundred bucks. Like, and you know, and once the stretch goal, stretch goal funds. And, you know, and we actually got, and, and part of we optimized for a mix of like, people who we thought we would be cool. I asked some rabbis for Dream Apart because I thought that was appropriate. Um, uh, and also people who had their own audience that they could bring in. So like, you know, I, some of my science fiction writer friends like Alan Kushner and Mick, Nick Mamadas who have their own, you know, who would blog about it and they'd, or, you know, uh, you know, whatever, post on social media about it and they'd have their own following who would be, who'd become interested in it. Um, but it was really bite-sized. So exactly what Jay is saying about like, each one of them was atomic. It either happened or it didn't. If they said no, it was fine. And, you know, um, you know, and then we could ask other game designers or other um, and other people to just give us a I've little tidbit. Even, I've even worked on projects where we've come to the conclusion that even something like that would be yeah. too large scope for what we're trying to do. Like, yeah, that is yeah. genuinely like, you know, like it is like m Sleep Away was just a book. And mm -hmm. it was, we didn't even have international shipping, right? It was literally just a book and I shipped it out of my living room. Uh, right. So I couldn't do international shipping. And like, you know, like any stretch goals that I did were made, you know, like were, were I think more ambitious than that, but also were a logistical hell. And like mm -hmm. the, it is very easy to, when in the planning stage, commit to a thing that in the future you'll find hard to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that the way to survive a crowdfunding project, which is truly like fe the most feast or famine you can get, right? Like you will get effectively given all the money that you will make for the first year of the project right there in front of you. And now you have to then do the thankless work of actually making the thing. Um, and like, the like, for example, just in a very concrete way, I have ADHD. Um, if I have to write a thing after the kickstarter my like demand avoidance kicks in and i just can't write so i can't i never go to kickstarter unless the text of the game is in a state where if i didn't touch it again i would still be okay with people getting it in their hands that's mm -hmm. just a rule i have to have for myself i there are so many horror stories of people doing a kickstarter and then realizing they can't write the game and then, you know, whittling away the budget as they try and try to write until they run out of steam and then the whole thing crashes and burns. And like, you don't want to, you don't want to be there, right? You want to, you want to make sure that everyone is set up to do well, which means, and that includes yourself. And that means not putting unfair expectations on yourself, you know, like as you go down the line of the project. So like, that is like learning your own patterns and comforts there is a really kind of important part and like first pay, like making sure yourselves like making sure that you're compensated so that like you don't burn yourselves out um which like helps when you're a team of people because you can all look out for each other and make sure that everyone else is being compensated um like you're not it's like when it's a solo project it's really easy to just be like oh my pay doesn't matter but when there's four of you you can be like no you know maybe my pay doesn't matter but you three matter mm -hmm. 
and that helps. Um, but uh, like, you got to make sure you're compensating yourselves, and you got to make sure you're like respecting your time and knowing your limits, and like being kind to yourselves in that way, because uh, sh shooting yourself in the foot is like it's not a cool self-sacrificing moment. It does just make the thing worse. Um, and every single time people be like, I'm doing a cool self-sacrificing moment. And it's like, you made the thing worse. <laughs> it was actually really, like, I wish you had it. It would have been better for everyone if you mm -hmm. hadn't. So mm -hmm. that's my kind of big, that's, I think, the biggest hurdles that it's really easy to make. That is, like, my big warning sign, like, oh, you're starting a new Kickstarter? Great. I hope you're paying yourself well. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I think also that there's a question, I mean, we were sort of jumped, jumped right into like, I mean, that was the question you asked about our experience, but there is a, a broader, a meta question about like, what do you mean by published? Like, because there's a whole lot of, right? Like, because there's a difference yeah. between if you're, if you're like, well, we're students, we want a calling card. We want this thing that this is going to be put up, PDF we put up and like, we want, you know, like we hope people play it versus saying, well, we want to establish a sustainable business. This is what we're going to be doing for the next five years. That, you know, like, those are very mm -hmm. different. And there's a lot of things in between. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, or or I mean, there are you know it. While it is a lot, while while I think the typical mode and a very successful mm -hmm. mode is to do self-publishing, it's also possible to be like, yeah, I'm not really any good at that. Like, I'm either going to find a publisher for this, or I'm going to move on, right? Like that, you know, or I'm going to mm -hmm. put it up for free. And there's also models that maybe aren't appropriate for this kind of game, but like some people, I, I will just say for completeness, are better off being like, I'm gonna have a Patreon and I'm gonna put up something every month and it's gonna be different. And I don't know, it won't be a finished thing. It'll just be, you're just watching me work in a way. Um, so I don't know, that, not, not that I've done any of those things <laughs> necessarily. I mean, I have more experience with the world of prose fiction, but you know, like, uh, um, but you know, there there are lots of different things and it's worth asking, what do you mean and what do you want to achieve and what do you mean by published, you know? When, um, when I was, when I, when Wander Home took off, right? Like when it, when it, it suddenly became clear that I was working on a scale I'd never worked on before in terms of popularity and financial success, I messaged Avery panicked because I know <laughs> that one of the worst things that happened to you is too much money too fast. Um, and I was like, Avery, what on earth do I do? And mm -hmm. she gave me some of the best advice that I repeat a lot, which is do the things you actually want to be doing. Don't do the rest of it. Don't like, do not feel that because you enjoy making games, you have to be a small business, right? Don't feel that because you enjoy writing things means you have to be stressed about book logistics, right? If you want to run a small business, you can run the small business. Just like understand that like when you are a small business, you have more in common with like the hardware store down the street than you do with like a, a writer kind of, you know, clicking away at the keyboard. Um, like you are taking on a, a different set of responsibilities that sneakily disguise themselves as writing responsibilities and they don't, they're not. Um, and yeah, you, I jumped immediately to crowdfunding because I, I anticipated if how help I, I I I read that question a certain I read that first question that set the tone a, a certain way and if, <laughs> if um, I think that um, you can you can always like like I think that having a good sense of like when Avery gave me that advice I like sat down and spent a week thinking about it and was like yeah I do want to run a small business actually I do mm -hmm. want to be a publisher like there are things about being a publisher that appeal to me and are important to me in ways that I couldn't access as just a writer um and so like that was the thing I opted into but like I do encourage you to know that running a, if, if your goal is crowdfunding if your goal is self-publishing that means that you are becoming a you are you are basically a pop-up publishing company right like you are creating a little structure like a lemonade stand to publish your games for the duration of the, the kickstarter money um and you know like that is that carries its own kind of like worries and responsibilities and you know kind of things to it if you are truly just like we just want to make a cool thing we don't care about what happens to it there are many other solutions and paths, some of which are very, like, it's kind of a, a running scale from like easy and quick, but very little financial reward to like difficult and time consuming with 
like a financial reward to like impossible to access, not a guaranteed financial reward. Uh, but if you can get there, maybe like traditional publishing is like on the furthest end of everything else in terms of some kind of spectrum. But uh, the, there are many, there are many paths ahead of you. And if you decide none of them work, there are, you can always blaze your own path, right? Um, and I think, you know, there's four of you. So it's also worth thinking, does anybody here want to do the bookkeeping? Like, is there, is there, like what, what is, what are different strengths and, and talents and weaknesses? And, and there's a bunch of spectrums. I mean, you know, getting published by, I don't know, Wizard of the Coast is a long shot, but like having a friend who's like, well, actually I do like the business side. Maybe I'll be the business guy and you guys be the creatives. Like that might be, that might happen, right? Like, you so- that th will throw off your whole four suits, four seasons mode. <laughs> <laughs> well, there'll be like a, a mysterious, I don't know, like in the back, like the ETH, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah we'll add secret more to our game. Right. <laughs> that secret will bounce around the King hive mind. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen the fifth element? That explains our bookkeeper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everybody knows that the fifth season is money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <So true>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true we literally right now is currently hiring a bookkeeper like i've spent the past two weeks just like or an office manager like in endless interviews talking to people for that and it really is like we're just on the hunt for like like the the kind of brain that really loves spreadsheets mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god i i work as a producer so spreadsheets are my entire life um nice so, oh, man. <laughs> but i cannot oh, look at another one I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh well, you're poison yeah. poison good <laughs> you'll do great don't worry this um, may have just like, turned into a job interview. Maybe you're going to be right. Possum Creek Games. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> be your day job gig. That's that, we like do have a habit on this be. podcast of of uh, randomly. Marianne likes to. I feel like in Marianne's stead, I should be randomly, you know, like saying, "Wait, you should do." Anyway, she she likes to. <laughs> we can't get through a podcast without Marianne starting a project or offering somebody a job. So, um, God. <laughs> <laughs> she is, you know, a dynamo of social serial mm -hmm. entrepreneurship and stuff. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, what are the other questions? Also, if you want to speak to, do you want to go into the other questions? Or also, if you want to speak to what do we mean by published? That's also, mm -hmm. like, I'm also curious what you guys are thinking about. Yeah, that. I mean, some of our questions are tied into that. Um, mm -hmm. Well, let's go on with I your questions we, yeah, then. We can jump uh, into some of those. So uh, some of the things that we've been thinking. So I think our main goal is that we have a game and we want people to have our game. Yeah, um, yeah. We, I think, are sort of unclear about, you know, do we want to take this? Like, it's like, if it succeeds, yeah, great. We want to make more games. Well, we'd love to make more games. But, like, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to have time. I don't know if we're going to have bandwidth. Um, but for this specific project, um, we want our game in people's hands in yeah. some way or another. What we're sort of trying to figure out is, like, okay, is this just a digital thing? Is it a PDF or, like, how are we going to try to do a print version? And if we are, like, how do you do a print version of a book? Um, like, what what are the steps to go through that? Is it worth trying to make a print book before we have, like, a set, uh, like, audience to buy it? Uh, is it, or, like, uh, do we do the pr PDF first, and then if people like it, we make a print book? What's the, like, what are the steps for doing that? Um allow me to tell you all about the, the marvels of print books i really strongly advocate for people to do physical books when they can mm -hmm. um there's a couple reasons for that first off it's because um it feels good uh it, it you will the endorphin rush you will get from holding the book in your hands will um like make it all feel worth it in a way that is just sadly not true of any other form of object um more importantly though I think print books are really important for the longevity of the object. There's kind of this notion that like digital lasts forever and that's not true. The digital world is incredibly ephemeral, both in terms of like a literal, like, you know, like I follow um, archivists online who are constantly talking about the headaches of like trying to preserve, you know, 20 year old digital content. I've like, I've literally like done sleuthing. I've had to go like hunt down original creators of games from 2006 to be like, hey, I can't find your game online anymore and I need it. Um, 
and like no, they haven't touched games in 20 years and i'm like just messaging this guy in new zealand but um you know so like pdfs are more you know they're more lossy they also uh slip through people's minds faster they're not a physical object they're not a reminder they don't have that same tangibility or cultural impact that a book can have um which is not to say like pdfs are inferior or something but it is just to say like, like there are many good reasons to make a pdf and like i you should always have a pdf alongside your book but like and like if you're in a spot where your conclusion is we can only do a book that's a totally fine conclusion to come to but um there are, you know, it's not just a thing of, oh, the PDF is simpler and cheaper. Therefore, we should do that and not the book. It is like PDFs don't have, the, like PDFs get relegated to the same brain vortex as like phone games, you know, whereas like a book takes on, like it has staying power. It is a, a, a constant living advertisement for the game. It changes how people can engage with it. It's a magical object. Um, it's an important object. And like, if possible, making the book will, I think, be like, if if that is a thing that is logistically feasible for you, I strongly encourage it. Um, the good news is also, there's a lot of different ways to make a book. Um, I think the big branching choice to make uh, is, um, whether or not you want to do print on demand or uh, like a traditional print run. Um, for a traditional print run, you can work with, I work with Tony Vicinda, who's over at Plus One X EXP, uh, who we've mentioned earlier on the show even, uh, who's a great guy who also works at a, who works with a warehouse that like will help fulfill your book for you and like kind of manage a lot of the like keeping track of the object. Uh, there are other places that do that too. Indie Press Revolution, uh, Heart of the Deernicorn. They will also be like, we'll take your book and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll help distribute it to Kickstart to your backers or you know to game stores or whatever. Um, and so, like, one option, right, is to do a crowdfunding, get a bunch, you know, get a little pile of cash, you know, buy two thousand copies of the book, you know, like, you know, let's say you've got like five hundred backers, buy like, you know, a thousand copies of the book you know, send half of them to the backers, sell the other half, use that money for a second print run, you know, buy 2000 copies of the book, you know, sell those out to game stores over the next several years, you know, make a little paycheck every couple of months and like have that as like a cushion for your future projects. That is one good process and approach. Um, another one is print on demand where, you know, Mixum is recently offering a, a new service for that. There are other printing companies that do that. Drive through RPG does that where uh, print on, in print on demand, you, uh, you, you make less money per book sold, but uh, you don't have to worry about the overhead or like keeping track of any books. Just anytime someone buys the book from that store, they print out a copy and mail it to that person. Um, and like in the world of book printing, there's like other factors at play, right? You know, thinking about black and white versus color, or like what size page and like those kind of, you know, those kind of choices you can make. There's a lot of thinking about like, you know, you're, you're, you're in manufacturing. And so you're thinking about, you know, like how many can we print out? How much money does it cost per book? You know, if we print out, you know, 2000 instead of 1000, how much cheaper is each book? You know, where are we getting this printed from? Those kinds of questions can all come up, but uh, having, you know, and like, if that's the sort of thing where you're like, oh, I love that sort of stuff. And like, great news books are, you, you, you can have a lot of fun art, you're debating paper types, um, uh, which genuinely is fun for me, um, but is not for most, but, uh, physical books are a good way to give your project longevity and to make it kind of part of the cultural conversation in a way that PDFs can struggle to have that same impact. That said, there's a lot of good reasons to do PDFs. So, but I personally will always kind of take the side of books uh, when, when possible. I mean, that all that makes a lot of sense. I will, I will say again, with the sort of like, what, where are you in this life cycle? What do you mean by publishing that? Like another thing to consider, and I'm curious what you have to say about this, Jay too, is that you don't necessarily need to be at the end of this. I mean, you just have this, you have this draft, you're about to go into play testing. There's no, there's not, I mean, you know, there may be a clock in terms of how much attention and momentum and how long the hive mind lasts. Like that's something also to consider. What do we want to do before we, you know, end up getting sucked into different things. But, um, but, uh, but also 
it's legitimate to say, well, there's going to be a gestation period where we're just for a while, we're going to be going to different cons and showing this and play testing and playing with people and getting the word out. And, and maybe at some point in that process, we put up an Ashcan version of it to, you know, and people start playing it. And then we gauge, like, is this, is the, are we getting a response that would indicate like, oh yeah, maybe we should be, you know, people are asking, is there a book? Right. Um, you know, and, and, I mean, if you're not, that doesn't mean don't do it, right? Like, if you believe in it, you want it out there. That's not that. That's not a reason to do it. But um, I don't know. Like, I mean, I again, I don't have that much experience in this, but except for looking over Avery's shoulder. But Dream Askew was an ash can. Like, Dream, Dream Askew was initially like this. You know, I think ten to fifteen page PDF that Avery just made, stuck on the website. I think it was you know a Patreon thing or something, and it was like, yeah, it's up here. I did it. Whatever. I'm moving on. And then you know. Really only after, I mean, then I was like, hey, I want to make a hack of this. And then we started talking about it. And then Avery, um, not because, not necessarily because I said that, but, but as as part of the process of, I think, taking a break from games, coming back, doing Monster Hearts 2, and then being what like, what else should I tackle? Um, you know, that Avery decided, okay, let's do this full-fledged. So there, you know, but, 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 but even a little thing, like even if it's a, it, it isn't, it is obviously, you know, I mean, everything that Jay is saying about like there is something joyful about having a physical book in the world and like that's got lasting power and whatever. But like, you know, there's going to be like like not every project um, is the one you want to take all that way because it's a lot of work. Right. And and like if you're going to do that kind of creating the book, you know, you're also taking on um, I mean, it, you know, you you. Clearly, you're interested in game design and the writing and the art, but there's also the layout. And there's also, you know, if, if you're going to geek out about paper types, right? Like, there's a whole lot of skill sets. And it may be that, you know, you may find that you want to totally dive in on that. Or it, it's all, I guess, my, my, my the thing I want to say in counterbalancing thing is it's also not a failure if you made a really cool thing you like that you put up somewhere that people can get and that you play with people. And it's like, that. that's not the, you know what I mean? It's not like this is your one uh, uh, this is the, not, not that this is your one shot of any game you'll make. And also not that it's only one shot for this game, because you could put up a version of it. And then later, once there's, once either you have the time and interest or, or you're getting the momentum say, okay, now we're going to build this out. So, you know, you can do, uh, uh, anyway, that there, you know what I mean? Like an intermediate, an exploratory phase. I absolutely agree with that. I will also note, um, that, uh, a creative career is cumulative and like what that means is that like you will this regardless of what form you release this in regardless of how this goes it will get less attention than you would if you did two more projects after this right like that like each thing you make is the thing that builds upon the next thing and like as long as you don't like i don't know disaster like like it is truly like it would require like a truly monumental botching to like make it be an actual <laughs> impact on your career negatively overwhelmingly it is an impact on your career positively right like you are building the scaffolding for the next thing always um uh like for it to be botching it'd have to be like i don't know like offensive i feel like or like you know like like yeah uh, not only um, offensive but like offensive and then and then double down really like yeah, if you're yeah, offensive exactly. and clean it up properly like, that's probably okay I mean, you know what i mean like yeah like this game like you know like this game this game is like you know i don't know pro nazis like it just takes such an big, extreme <laughs> degree to like actually be a negative but um so don't do that uh <laughs> all right all right take notes <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. down no glorifying nazis <laughs> yeah, hope, hope, hope and i mean but on a serious on a serious note of that like and you may fuck up in which case it is a really important skill to be like resilient and understand how to like learn and apologize and you know what i mean like i, I kind of want to i kind of want to say this to all young creatives living in this era like it may come a time when the internet falls on your head right um, and the important skill set is not really to avoid that ever happening. The important skill set, and I've observed this a bunch of times in like you know my my life on the internet for the last 20, 20 years, is like to pay attention and listen and like you know what I mean. And like you can you know you can recover from things, um, it, you know, and and to to you know. If you are, if you are, if you're honestly open and paying attention and and taking responsibility, like like, you know, people often get terrified of like, oh my god, I'll say the wrong thing. And it's like it's probably okay if you are. People can tell if you're if you're acting in good faith, 
You know what I mean? I mean, people might be mad for a while. And one of the things that happens when the internet falls in your head is that it's possible to become a lightning rod for a lot of frustrations people have had for a long time about a kind of a kind of thing that you've just fucked up out of ignorance or whatever. Um, and you, it is perfectly reasonable that the that a people who've been experiencing some annoying thing or terrible thing, um, even though you did it just this one time out of ignorance, that their feelings about it are proportionate to the amount of that it has happened to them. That is reasonable. So like that, they're, that, that the world is really mad is like, you know, that's an understandable reaction. But, um, but like, you know, I, I, I've seen people gracefully like change course, pay attention, apologize, learn, mm -hmm. you know, correct. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that, you know, even if, I, even in that I, case, <laughs> I, I agree with that. I'm going to really quickly just pop back to an earlier thing just to make sure that I, I get this other thought out that's much more logistics minded than than social, which like I do agree with you and like I can talk about that more further. But but I did also just want to say that um, I want to lightly caution against the impulse to um, view like I think releasing a PDF while you're working on it is good. I think, you know, kind of putting things out there, like, especially in Ashcan formats or like preliminary formats is good. I caution against a full digital release as the setup to a full physical release. Like, mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. view a full digital release as like testing the waters. It is a, mm -hmm. it is a digital release. It's a whole yeah. thing you're doing. Um, it can be a really good way to like practice. Like if you want to release something digitally as like an emotional warm up to doing something physically, that's good. But, um, releasing something digitally fully first and then releasing it physically fully can just, it can, it, it, it might not always kind of like work as much of like, it, like, cause like, you know, it creates a spot where like someone, you know, got hyped about and paid 15 bucks for the PDF. And then they're like, oh, and now I have to pay 35 bucks for the book and the PDF. Like what mm -hmm. about the 15 bucks I just spent? And like, it, it's a little like it's like ripping off the band-aid tends to be like kind of the more exciting approach, especially because a physical release gets a magnitude of more attention than a digital release does, right? Like when you put something out physically, like, you know, there, you know, there will be people who you never heard of who are really excited about. The thing about Kickstarter is when people are on Kickstarter, they just kind of scroll through and find things. Like there's mm -hmm. like a lot of, you know, like people are just kind of like looking for the new physical thing coming out or like the thing that like maybe no one has heard of. And so like pu putting things out online, like, you know, like doing that kind of like physical momentum can oftentimes like especially when it's like hey guys this is our first thing look at this cool book mock-up we made isn't it pretty and people are like that does look really pretty and we get to support new creators this is awesome we love this um and they then they eat up your game like saturn devouring their kids um and it's great <laughs> and so i do like i do i think like releasing small things before releasing big things is good like getting practice with releasing things is good like zine quest is popular because it's a way to you know put on the training boots for you know making a, a larger project it has you know it has its own disadvantages right like turns out releasing a project at the same time as 50 other people is a good way to like not get as many eyes on your project but uh that like being in a spot where you're making a thing and like you you know you're able to make something and like you know excitedly put it out there um and like have that be the like have that be the like a kickstarter is itself the testing ground for the full release right like when it actually is available to buy that's the full release a kickstarter is effectively a, a pre-order um so you know like I although think that, as a caveat to that another thing that i got the sense of from avery is you do want to pitch your kickstarter so that it's not because I think I naively was like, well, I guess you go to Kickstarter and you see if there's enough people. But you, you know, you you kind of want to pick a number that you're that you hopefully can I, hit because you don't want to have like a Kickstarter that didn't fund. I guess I don't want to drown them in in budget specifics sure, sure, right now. Sure. But you oh, are, we yeah, need yeah. it. Correct. We need it's it so bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to drown in budget specifics? Okay. <laughs> we have um, we have a Google Doc called money, 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 money. Yeah. Oh man. All right. Well, this is like we, the hardest part for us to figure out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
we've made it an hour in and we are on question four. So maybe <laughs> yes, we... that's true. And tr typically we take a break in the middle of the podcast to give both us and our listeners a chance to get a glass of water or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and so Darius can play the cool outro music and then intro music. And I don't know, stick anything in the middle that he wants to. Um, so do we want to do that now and then try to yes. rapid fire the rest of the questions a little more? Sounds yeah. good. Yeah, that'd be great. Perfect. All right, great. So let's take five and then we'll come back. So we're back, it's everybody. And Welcome back. we're going to go through the list of questions. Mm hmm. What do we got? Oh, no tangents. No tangents. We're <laughs> okay. tangent free since 73. It's going to be a rapid fire round. Yeah, um, we would love to know sort of uh, what you might recommend for marketing to get those backers to want to fund this project if we go to Kickstarter. Sort of like what strategies have worked for you guys or what kind of things you've done. Um, Twitter uh, slash TikTok <laughs> are both places where designers are active. Horizontal networking, making friends with other designers to, to, and talking about their games and getting integrated into the community is both like a good life thing to do and also a conveniently also a good marketing strategy. Um, when you're first starting out, a lot of the support you're going to get are going to be from your fellow designers. Um, and then as like they get to know you and they introduce you to their fans, then their fans kind of get to know you as well. So like at first you want to be making, you want to be connecting with designers like this. Um, podcasts are really good. There's a lot of great podcasts running your game on those places or talking to those people is really good. Lots of like good inroads there. Um, lean to your strengths. Don't feel pressured to do TikTok if all of you hate TikTok. <laughs> Um, if, you, if you've got that, like, if you've got that, like, influencer charm, then like, bring that. But don't feel obligated to. It'll be more useful to put your energy into things that maybe aren't quite as high paying off, but that you're more confident in, rather than feeling obligated to do social media that you're not sure about. Don't worry about advertising. You don't have the money for that. Um, no, you don't, you don't get there until like you're doing large projects. Like that's just not like investing money in advertising is not worth it right now. Um, one other thing. Oh, uh, the cover art for your game is the most valuable piece of advertising you can have. Uh, make sure that whatever you're using as your promotional image is like eye catching and compelling, um, which like, so I just throw that at you, our artist, you know, the artist, uh, <laughs> but like, that is, I think, the thing that, like, you know, that's the thing that is going to be the most, like, dollar for dollar, or, you know, like, this is not only the advice I give to people when they're hiring an artist, but, like, that, if you're going to, like, literally, if you need, if you're going to have one piece of art that is, like, done and good and that you're really happy in, that is the one that it should be. That's going to be the thing. That's, like, your cover art is the best selling object for your game. And so having it be something you're proud of and you feel confident in is like, that's the, like, every, like literally I point this out to people, Wander Home sells because of its art. If you go back to the Kickstarter page from when we first released it, the only finished piece of art was the cover art. Everything else was sketches or just not present. And so people are like, oh my God, wow, Wander Home sold because of its great art. And it's like, yeah, it wasn't done. The only <laughs> art that people had to believe us on was the cover art. And we just, you know, hired someone who regularly did cover art in other contexts and had a lot of experience and made something really cool but like that first image mwah, that's your baby yeah i and i i mean that all sounds amazing i would say i mean just to, to emphasize the point about like do play to your your strengths and do what you like like uh, that, that that's true in you know so i mean some of this is transferable from my fiction writing stuff i mean it's like whatever you actually like doing and nourishes you you know, in a way you're, you're trying to, and it is cumulative, like, like uh, Jay was saying, like you, you're going to, uh, um, uh, you know, you're putting down roots, you know, you're that are, that'll grow like every, everything, you know, and as long as, as the interactions that you're having, you know, as long as you're enthusiastic and authentic and you're actually doing what you care about and you're, you know, you're, you're spending time where you like to spend time, like that's going to accumulate, right? You're going to make connections. You're going to, you know, and you're going to be, you know, and as Jay was saying, like enthusiastically sharing other people's games and connecting with other people. Um, and I remember, I want to tell a little anecdote. When I went, when I was a baby science fiction writer, I went to the first Worldcon I went to in like Anaheim, I think it must have been like, 
2005 or something. <laughs> and um, I, I was, you know, I, I knew I'd gone to Clarion West, which is, uh, you know, uh, apparently that's Wayfinder Camp for science fiction writers <laughs> in terms of like l launching. You know, I, I knew I began to knew people and I was like, you know, writing stories, publishing them. But and I was and I got there and I was like, I had this weird confusion the first time I was there. I was like, is this meant to be a social space or am I meant to be kind of on the job? Like I was like, I really got, I was a little freaked out. I was like, I don't want these relationships to be like, uh, you know, mercenary. Like, I don't want to be second guessing myself. Like I should go, should I go hang out with these people? They're important. It might be good for my book. Maybe I'll meet editors and sell stories. Like that's gross. But at the same time, I was like, I'm spending all this money to come here. I'm supposed to be marketing. I'm supposed to be turning myself into a professional. Like, how does this work? Like, how do I know if these, you know, how do I, how do I gauge the line between like doing like hanging out with friends and being real, but also I'm supposed to be making connections that will be good for business. Like, how do I judge that? And I, I talked to Daniel Abraham, who uh, is a guy I still know a little bit, but I, I, I was hanging out with him. Um, he's one of the guys who was behind the expanse. And, um, but he was baby. He was a slightly less baby science fiction writer also at the time. And he said, he, he gave me an F, F. Scott Fitzgerald quote, which was, never marry for money go where the money is and marry for love <laughs> which like <laughs> not that i would take that literally but like in the sense that like you've already tell your marketing brain by getting here to worldcon you already did that they already you already did that you did the professional part you did the mercenary thing you put yourself in the right place now just have fun and connect with people like for, don't worry about it like it's got, like the best thing you could possibly do for your career is to not worry about it and like just <laughs> have the most fun you have with it because those will naturally be the people who you know you're going to help each other out you're going to form a team you're going to be like on each, you know uh you're going to have each other's back like that's that's going to happen naturally so you can you you know you you can you you like have marketing brain on to the extent that you're like which con should i go to buy the ticket get yourself on the plane make sure you've got you know copies of whatever to hand out or whatever it is and then forget about that stuff. You know what I mean? And just have the best possible time. And like, you know, and like, you know, but I mean, like get yourself to like, you know, I mean, I often am like on panels and you do the thing where you hold up your book and whatever, like that's like, like, like that's, that's like the paying, like there are certain things you should check off, but like, you don't want to go into every conversation being like, I just wrote a book. Here's my thing. Right. <laughs> like, like You just want to, you just want to put yourself on the, in the spot where it's going to be the natural course of things that you'll make connections and you'll, and you'll, have great interactions mm -hmm. and you'll find mutual enthusiasm. You just want to get there and then just, you know, just have fun, just focus on doing what you love and comes naturally. And that's really like, in some ways, the best marketing, right? <laughs> like, also, because people can tell. I also want to really quickly note, um, I mentioned horizontal networking very quickly. I want to just define that term in relation to vertical networking, where traditionally like so there's like schmoozing right where you're like there's someone who has more twitter followers more status or like has a high paying industry job and you're like wow you know i want in on that i'm going to vertically network with them uh that's that's vertical networking is like the ladder climbing it's generally like don't do that right like don't like try to seek someone out because of that you will seek people out because it's like wow you're more established that's cool but like you know, as I think the stuff Ben you're saying is like really important where it's like, it's very obvious when someone's in my DMs because they want something from me, <laughs> like that it, it feels really bad and weird. And like, I've made friends with a lot of newer designers because we just talked about design and just chatted. And then like, you know, while we were chatting, they men made a mention of some project. I'm like, oh, that looks cool. And then like, that's, you know, we became friends. And like that to me, like that's, the the vertical networking relationship and is like you know you will have those you will connect with people where you're like i can't believe i'm talking to this person right now um it, like that will that will happen I, it happens to me still uh but Wait, like, we're currently on a podcast yeah. with jay dragon <laughs> <laughs> right now, literally. <laughs> yeah yeah no for sure i know that feeling um i sometimes it happens mutually which is always very wild like i yeah, have the, yeah. a little bit with you ben um, right. Likewise. Yeah. Yes. We were saying in the email, I was like, yeah, totally big fan. Oh and that happens a lot. That happens a lot that you'll go. And it's, it's great. I just let me jump in to say a, 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 a legit kind of 
vertical is to just express fan admiration. If you just go to people and are like, your stuff is amazing. Like as long as it doesn't seem like you're trying to get something from them, like everybody likes yeah. that, right? I mean, maybe not if yeah. they're, I don't know, super tired and you're the hundred millionth. I mean, maybe, maybe not George R. R. Martin. I don't know. Like, <laughs> but even then, <laughs> yeah, even he then. Still likes like, it. He's he just probably like still likes it. it you know, yeah. even then it's, it's, uh, it's lovely to, to, and, and, and sometimes you discover, once you start putting stuff out there, sometimes you discover that it's mutual, right? Like sometimes they'll be like, oh yeah, you too, you know? And then that's, you know, and that's great. But the other thing that I want to mention is horizontal networking, which is, um, RPGs, like basically any creative industry, tend to have cadres or like generations or like peer groups where you will be making your first project alongside a lot of other people who are also making their first project and connecting with those people or like maybe people are making their second project or maybe they're making their first physical project or maybe they're like going from like, you know, putting out 200 word RPGs to putting out a full thing, right? Like, but, or like maybe they're just someone who, you know, like, has been wanting to do this for a while. It's been low key for a while, but they haven't really put themselves into it until recently. But like, you will have a peer group of people who are kind of at a similar stage to you um, and connecting with those people, getting to know them, talking about their stuff, um, becoming, you know, like getting to know their work is so, is like genuinely more important than getting to know like who's who. Like you can, you can go into RPGs and not know a single publishing company and have an important and meaningful time if you get to know your friends at the same level as you, right? And like, that is such a valuable thing to do. And like, that's why I think Twitter is such a popular like place for designers, despite its many, 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 many flaws, <laughs> um, <laughs> is that uh, it lets you connect with people who are at a similar ex like energy, you know, who are at a similar like spot to you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like finding those spaces is like, like that is frankly what the four of you are right now effectively is like you are, you know, you are a little horizontally networking, you know, clump, but finding also those other people uh, and yeah. like connecting with them, spending time with them will help, will both, it'll both make your work feel more meaningful because you're in conversation with your peers and like it's it's artistically enriching to be working alongside others, but also it is on a practical level useful because y your peers, you know, as you go up the industry together, your peers will be your biggest connection, and like you will multiply, you'll have a multiplying effect on all of the work you do. So having those peers, even if you're not like collaborating, even if you're just bouncing ideas or you're in the same spaces, are so valuable. And in a way, RPGs are a great, um, you know, a great, uh, it's, 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 there's a great op opportunity to do that in a way, because if you go to a, mm -hmm. you know, when I go to a science fiction country conference and meet other authors, I have like a great time talking to them, but I actually have to go away to read their book. Right? <laughs> like if I want to see what their work is like, I have to be like, all right, let me take this to the, <laughs> you know, it's like, whereas like, if you go to like a lot of, I mean, especially there's a lot of little, um, um, I mean, I keep going to Camp Nerdly and I know that like Metatopia and other places like that, Big Band Con, like there's a lot of places people go and like all those people, as as Jay's saying in that court, you only play each other's games. You just play a bunch of games. You see who you're really excited about, you know, and, and you know, you're, you, it's, and, and run yours. You know what I mean? And that, that's just a very uh, natural um, uh, path to making those connections. Yeah, I, I want to dig, and this is another one of our questions, so we're covering more things. Um, uh -huh. uh, so both in like in these peer groups and in other parts of the industry, like how, what is the way to go about meeting people? Like we we have, I guess, like we're sort of starting to do like social media mm -hmm. stuff, and we're at our school, and there's a bunch of nerds at our school that we're talking to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you talk about cons, like what? Yeah. Where are good places to go? Where like how do we how do we do that? How do we build those connections? Mm -hmm. So um, there's two main avenues for building connections um, online and in real life. Both are going to be valuable in their own ways. If you end up more on one than the other, you'll be fine. Um, online, um, this is also, just to be clear, because this is a podcast for posterity, this is such 2023 advice. Yeah, I might be yeah. wrong. <laughs> I might be wrong two years from now. This is 2023 right. advice. Like, there's a lot of stuff I've said that's more broadly applicable. This is now only. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, 
discords are really good finding designer discords like like the possum creek games discord server um or <laughs> link link in the yeah. show notes <laughs> um but like finding finding designer spaces like discords which tend to be more private spaces where people are more equalized um is a really great space to connect with people um play testing spaces or game playing spaces like the gauntlet um is really you know like beloved in that way or the dirt goblin community center or you know the, oftentimes like these spaces will have a very small pay uh wall uh, literally a paywall um no, no, i forgot the word for that um <laughs> but uh that's just because uh like one dollar a month can keep a lot of the like toxic members of the community mm-hmm. at bay and so like uh, you'll encounter those like very small little hurdles um there are other free spaces though um you know, like those kind of those, you know, discords, those communities or like Facebook groups are another. Um, Twitter is kind of like the big melting pot. Twitter's great because everyone is there. Twitter sucks because everyone is there. Um, uh, TikTok is a good way to like find out about like people you might be fans of or like works you might be able to like be interested in, but isn't actually good for like a, a, a two way relationship. TikTok is designed for parasociality. Tumblr is becoming increasingly popular again, which is cool. Um, any of the like Twitter escape platforms, uh, yeah, like might Mastodon might happen. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll find out in the, tw- in the in the post twenty twenty three version of this. We'll find out if any of those. <laughs> yeah, we'll be like, oh my god, it's Snorpley, you fools! Uh, go to Snorpley. <laughs> um, uh, and then like literally, even like Reddit has like ways to form community if you like Reddit. Um, I hope you get better soon, but like, you know, you can go there. <laughs> um, um, and then like in real life spaces, um, conventions, especially um, there are more designer focused conventions. I think that the big designer focused convention is Big Bad Con, which is in San Francisco and is genuinely fantastic. If you can make your way there, they also do Big Bad Con online, which is also fantastic. Um, but that is like, my like if you make it to one con and you're a designer go to this one um it's such a good space for everything you need um there's also a lot of uh cons that are more like customer uh like like gen con is kind of the classic rpg convention it's got like 50 to eighty thousand people and has like zero covid precautions now apparently (laughs) which like great awful um (laughs) but um uh like you know if you're maybe if maybe you know if when the pandemic is less omnipresent uh cons like that can be good ways to meet lots and lots of people even if it's easy to get drowned out in the crowd there are also smaller cons that do that but aren't more safe uh like um at Pax Unplugged is like a, a good middle ground and it's also like Possum Creek's home convention because it's in Philly um, and your local con, like whatever, you know, like whatever's going on in Vermont that's, you know, like hopping in there and, you know, maybe it's got 300 people, but like if it's an RPG con, there might be like one or two other designers who you can get to know and they invite you to their Discord server and like that kind of thing where it's like uh, even smaller events, like, you know, like just making friends with people who like your game is just, is itself a good, you know, networking moment. Um, I, I, but, I, I yeah, know people I like I, Metatopia too. I haven't been, but I know that's a, that's been the, so that whole, right now, as of 2023, um, yeah. I believe that series of conventions, Dexcon, Dreamation, Metatopia, uh, I are on hold. I have not okay. heard of them maybe starting up again. I don't, I don't, yeah. that's why I didn't them because I would normally recommend those. I just don't mm-hmm, think that mm-hmm. they're doing Another people, another place that's historically had a lot of like great indie game designers in this in this vein is uh, Camp Nerdly, where the you know Jason Morningstar is often there, and and Avery used to go, and that's in in Virginia, so that's Mm -hmm. my neck of the woods when I'm stateside. I mean, one thing to do is to if you if you uh, one one way to get a good vibe of of the kind of place you might want to go is if you have uh, people you admire. That you're like, wow, this this kind of work is really cool. I'd like to go. Then you could just go to their website and look where they're going to show. Like people usually list their appearances. Like we'll be at this, and that can kind of get you a vibe for the you know the kind of place that's going to you know, have the kind of games that you're interested in. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and a lot of things that aren't 
properly speaking gaming conventions start are starting to have gaming tracks. I mean, I my favorite science fiction convention is Wiscon, and it has a pretty robust like I did a bunch of playtesting there. Um, like I did, you know, solidly a lot of playtesting of of Dream Apart there because there's so even though it's not a game convention, like there's you know there's always games running and uh, and that's you know that's a useful way to to get things out there and and kind of you know cross fertilize there's people from different genres doing you know there's a lot of indie authors also, there and stuff so yeah and also like uh uh you don't have to strictly go and like who's doing tabletop games i gotta go in that way right like you know one of the things that's great about tabletop games is it's intensely cross-disciplinary and like you know uh, uh, there's so many people who are doing like adjacent things and like the industry yeah. itself is such a cross-disciplinary vibe that like you know, if you go to a video game con and you're the only tabletop game designer there, first off, people will go to you as an authority on topics that, like, suddenly a bunch of video game designers are, like, <laughs> asking your opinions on, like, ludonarrative dissonance or something bizarre like that. Um, which, you know, like, let me Google something real quick. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but then also, like, now you're making connections with these, you know, table with these video game designers, and they're like, oh, my God, wait, I have a friend who does that. Let me get you in touch with my buddy. You know, oh, they're, you know, they're super small. You've probably never heard of them, but they run Mophidius. And then suddenly, like, you've met this, you know, or like, you know, I've got a friend who, like, there's, you make, you make the wildest connections because different industries will have different senses of what, what is cool or not cool or whatever. Right. So you can, you can make all sorts of interesting connections by just going to places that you think are cool mm -hmm. for other yep. reasons. And then, yep. like, being the tabletop game designer there <laughs> yeah and a lot of these things a lot of the, a lot of convention stuff there's plenty of opportunity to like participate on programming i mean not only can you play test your games but you know as i think days alluding to like you can just sign up and be on panels a lot of places and they'll like now you're the tabletop designer on the panel or whatever um and uh yeah and and you know and 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 at, you know it's a good point all these things are touch on tabletop gaming i mean video games and like board games and like writers and artists and everything that's all you know uh there are there are useful cross pollinations to have in all of these uh in all these ways that's very more questions <laughs> um yeah i think the last thing we don't have like too much longer but we want to get some of that money talk uh, uh -huh. in in the thing so jay you had some money thing that you were going to say before we went on break um do you want to start off with that and then we can follow up with future money questions? Yeah. So money talk. Um, you do this enough and you start being able to build a Kickstarter budget in your head. Um, here's the thing to understand about your budget. Um, let's say, for example, um, your book, you're printing a thousand books and it's going to cost you um two dollars per book so it's going to cost you two thousand dollars to print a thousand books um you each need to get and then like then you kind of do the math on like all right how much does the art cost how much does the editing cost how much does the layout cost you're making sure people are getting compensated you add that to this thing right and then it's like how much does it cost to ship the books from where they're getting printed to where i am right how much is that that's probably like two you know that's like another little chunk um and then you've got that pile um and then you want some set aside for a rainy day and then 10 percent of whatever you raise is going to the crowdfunding platform and to credit cards um so you're making 90 percent of whatever you raise and then the gap in between that set of costs i just said and the amount you the 90 percent of whatever you raise is your profits so you can break it down like that's kind of the like the most bare bones like if i'm napkin mathing anything i'm asking those questions like how much does it cost to print the books how many books do you want to print what is going to be the editing you know how many words is it so i can estimate editing like how much do you want to spend on art how much do you want to spend on layout you know what is an important you know like, how much are you spending on writing uh and then like you know kind of getting that number and then multiplying it by whatever weird coefficient you need to do to get it to be 90% of a larger number and then I round that's that's the most like if I'm going full little you know like Seth Rogen doing math in my head about <laughs> kickstarters that's the that's the little equation um and everything else is building on top of that um the big things to understand about money 
is um, first off, um, money brings out the worst in people. Um, it just, it does, it makes things stressful. Um, I really recommend, especially as you're working together as a group, having, even if it's not a contract, having an, a, 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 like sitting down and writing down what you all agree will be the way money is distributed and then sticking to that is really going to be important. Um, Cause it's those kinds of clear agreements that preserve, you know, like uh, there's a saying in, in publishing that's contracts save friendships um, and having <laughs> mm-hmm. an agreement like that. I was going to say that too. Really, <laughs> yeah. Um, having an agreement because like it's easy really... to dodge it and be like, ah, this is an uncomfortable topic. Never mind, we'll talk about it later. Mm-hmm. And then what happens is people have just different yeah. unexpressed, you know, if you talked about it, it would have been fine. But mm-hmm. if people have unexpressed different uh, expectations, and then you know, feelings get attached to that, and it, be, you know, know, what I mean, and people and everybody gets triggered around money. So it's just if you if you figure it out ahead of time and make a really clear agreement, it saves a lot of it, yes. it helps a lot. Yes, absolutely. Um, Exactly, and there are, I yeah. mean, the other awkward thing about that that I'm not actually even sure how to handle is there are sometimes when you should probably renegotiate that equipment. Like sometimes you go in on something with a buddy and you're like, we're going to be 50 50. And then years later, you found out, wait, it ended up that one person did like 80% of the work. The other person kind of fell off the face of the earth and the other person finished the project. And it's like, you at some point have to have, have to then be like, well, let's look at this again and figure out what's fair. But I mean, it really it goes a long way to just have clear communication and good faith, you know. An ideal contract says, this these are your responsibilities and this is what you're getting compensated for when you do those responsibilities that way if you don't do those responsibilities you can rearticulate the compensation yep. but ideally you are saying and like it's a good thing to have with anyone you work with um but like especially for each other it's a really important kind of like everyone being on the same page um also um, I mentioned a rainy day fund. That thing is really important. With your first project, no matter what, you're gonna botch something. I, I don't know what it is. I literally, I could spend the rest of the day giving you advice and you would find something to botch. It is fundamental <laughs> to the nature of making your first project that you will make a thing that you will botch something. For me, when I did sleep away, I had a bunch of botches. I um, I ordered the wrong sized mailers to ship i forgot to budget in shipping supplies to the cost of shipping i ordered the wrong sized mailers i ordered them exactly the same size as the book when they needed to be large enough to like hold the book inside of them um and i had to like emergency call up a friend who like worked at ups the usps to like grab you know like enough mailers to be able to ship them out that weekend um i like uh, you know, like, um, there's just like, there's like things like that, right? Um, uh, like, you'll just, you'll find something there and having an amount that's set aside that's like, you know, I don't know what we're going to do with this yet, but it is kind of our emergency. If something goes wrong, we don't have to worry about it. You know, we have an insulation is really critical for budget making. Um, for your budget goals, um, for a smaller, pro- when you set your goal on Kickstarter, a thing that is kind of hard to always balance, which Ben, you actually brought up earlier, is that um, people are more likely to back once they know the project will succeed. Additionally, an early success is a good sign of a healthy project in the future. It, it is rewarded by the algorithm and it's rewarded by the buyers. So you want your project to reach its funding goal as soon as possible. But um, you don't wanna end the project without enough money to fund. You want, your pro- you want your funding goal to be a realistic reflection of the amount you're hoping to end with. Like, you know, at the very least is like a minimum. Like it should be a spot where if you get that funding amount, you should be able to finish the project. Um, you might not be happy about it, but you should be able to finish the project. And so finding a number that reflects like, we can make this at this amount, um, even if we might not be able to do everything we wanna do, like that's okay. But having that be your goal, instead of like the true, like this is our planned budget, there's gonna be a discrepancy there and that's okay. 
it's kind of a dirty secret of RPGs or like of Kickstarters in general. And like, sometimes you look at a project that's like three full color hardcover books, we're <laughs> raising $10,000. And it's like, no, no, you're not. That's not true. I don't lie to me. Like, you know, who do you think I am? Like, I know how much it costs. Like it costs $10,000 to put one of those. Um, but, you know, it's just the truth of like budget for the amount of money you need so that you're not uh, like you can make the you can make the thing. Uh, like have that be your goal, but that doesn't have to be like your anticip your like hopeful budget. Um, a good way to figure out what your project should look like, by the way, this is a cool tool I use, um, is I call it Prince and Popper budgeting, where um, it's probably got like a fancier name and like a, a more correct name, but I that's what I call it, which is where I make a spreadsheet that is the most ostentatious version of the budget possible. If I if someone offered me a blank check, what could I make, right? Like, what's the most extreme version of this thing I could possibly imagine all the bells and whistles and doodads I feel comfortable doing? What's the most kind of extreme Prince version? And then the most pauper version I can imagine where it's like, what is stripped away, everything stripped away, bare bones, cheap as possible, dirt cheap everything. What does that look like? Um, and that tends to give me a good sense of like, what is what's the most bare bones version of this project? And then also maybe as we go down the line, what are my hopes for either, you know, maybe stretch goals or second editions or just a thing to release in the future? What could that look like? Um, I'll say also just two other things really quick. Mixam, M-I-X-A-M.com in as of 2023 is probably your best bet for printing. Uh, they are a book printer that does smaller print runs um, that is really popular in the RPG space. They do zines and also books. Um, they're pretty popular. We use them for our smaller print runs and they have a price calculator, which is what's really valuable. They will tell you how much it costs to print the things and the specifications you want. And when you go to other printers, that number will probably still be around true. So if you end up, you know, like going with someone else, mix them will have still given you a good first estimate for budgeting. So that tends to be my like when budgeting stuff, that's where I go. Uh, and that's specifically also, print run as opposed to print on demand, right? Yes, that is specific print run. That is, they do print on, they are starting to offer print on demand, but when budgeting print on demand, it's a really different world because the cost per book is going to be much higher, but you only have to print as many as you need. I also generally, like, if you want to be, if you want to focus on being a writer and you don't want to do any of the business stuff, print on demand is a better option. Um, the more you think that, like, long term, you would like to be operating as, like, someone with a long term stay. Um, print runs are better, and the reason for that is because print runs let you get into bookstores. They let you get into gaming stores. You can't really print on demand your way into a bookstore because the 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 mm, bookstores buy your book for half cost. Um, so, like they'll like a bookstore will buy your book for like ten dollars and then sell it for twenty dollars. And print on demand will generally cost like ten bucks to print. So it's not worth it for the bookstore. Like it's not worth it for anyone to do that. So whereas like print, you know, print runs mean like you're buying, you're printing the book for two bucks, selling it to a bookstore for 10 bucks, you're making money. And then the bookstore sells it for 20 bucks and they're making money, right? So that's kind of how that ecosystem works. I'm just I literally have, I, like- I have, a, I have another question, a follow-up question actually that I don't know the answer to yeah. about getting into bookstores, um, which is because I know about, fiction books like mm -hmm. so in order to get indie stuff into bookstores does it still like does it have to be an ingram like isn't there like a like there's a level of like them ordering from um or is there a class of bookstore that doesn't that's willing to just go to your printer so ingram is so there aren't bookstores that go to your printer um yeah ingram is the biggest distributor it's hard to break into as an rpg it's like something possum creek is working on right now mm. to like connect with ingram um generally what rpgs especially indie rpgs use are smaller public smaller distributors like indie mm. press revolution part uh, of the yeah. unicorn connecting with um plus one right. exp who does that sort of stuff um all those things are going to be um, like 
all those spaces uh, will have their networks. Uh, like Possum Creek has a network of bookstores at this point, but like so do other places. And like, mm -hmm. that's how you generally get it there is like you get it on Indie Press Revolution and then there's like bookstores that buy from Indie Press Revolution. Yeah, um, And then, you know, like, and so the last thing I'll say in terms of budgeting, in terms of how much should your book cost, which is I think always a question, um, your PDF can cost whatever you want it to cost. It should probably like look at what other people are doing and cost it around there. Your book should cost at least eight, but ideally 10 times the cost of manufacturing. So if it costs you $2 to print the book, you want to be charging at least $16, ideally $20 for the book. If the book costs you $5 to manufacture, you want to be charging at least uh, $45 and ideally $50, or, no, I did that wrong. At least $40, ideally $50 for the book. So that's how you can know. And like, if you look at that and you're like, this is not, no one's gonna spend $150 on my book, then it's like, you need to make it cheaper to manufacture because that's way too high. But like, ideally, if you're doing a print run, eight to 10 times is the sweet spot for that. Um, and it will feel like a lot, like you'd be like, I'm only paying two bucks for this thing. Why am I allowed to charge $20 for it? And that's because that other $18 is going into every single other part of operating a small business <laughs> besides the printing of the book. So do give yourself that eight to 10 times range. Um, I have a, a quick ball of distribution stuff. So um, like, as a group who has never created product before, do we like, do we send an email to someone who like, do we send an email to any press revolution or some other bigger like distributor like that? Or uh, like, what's, what's the deal with that generally? I spend for now, do you have uh, any sort of frame of reference on, on that? It's a great question. I think we need Jay. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I'm talking to my no boyfriend. worries. How do you get um, into Indie Press Revolution? How do you how do you or, make the connection? Yeah, any of these other distributors? Um, yes. Um, so um you do just send them an email. Uh that's the that's the approach. Um and you just send them a thing and you're like, Hey, can I publish my game with you? And or can I can I get my game in your thing? And they're like, Yeah, send us, you know. 50 copies or whatever, and you mail them 50 copies, and then they'll send you a quarterly check uh, as they move those copies. And then if you're, they're doing well, they'll be like, hey, can we get a bunch more? Um, Another thing that we haven't talked about in terms of, that, that occurs to me that we didn't talk about in terms of marketing, we sort of talk about, we, we, we talked about two categories, one of which is connection, making friends, do. And the other thing we talked about was advertising. Don't. But there's a third category, which is like, which I'd like to hear Jay's take on too, which is like reviews, blurbs, actual plays. Like, can you get your game out, you know, like, like, like covered co press coverage and stuff. We actually did a bunch of that stuff for Dream Apart, Dream is Cute. Now, naturally, again, I was writing the coattails of, uh, you know, uh, 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 game star. So like there was more entree and I had a fixed writing career where I could get covered in other places, but like we made a press kit and like, I don't know, it was like, and there's a certain angle, like, like just to speak briefly from that experience, like there was a certain, like, there's like places that cover games, but then also because it was a queer game and a Jewish game, it was like, well, let's pursue those things. I actually got a write up and dream apart in like tablet magazine, you know, it's sort of like, you know, if, if thematically or any other thing about it is like uh, interesting, sometimes it's possible to get, you know, some, somebody to pay attention to it um, based on, you know, a thematic angle or like a local angle or like, you know, like reasonably whatever small town in Vermont this is, ought to, the local paper ought to be interested if your game, you know, ends up uh, in bookstores, right? So, you know, that's another that's another whole angle on marketing is like press and stuff, which can be difficult, but it's like always worth, you know, knowing how to write a a quick uh, like a, a you know a, a a press release kind of you know or a letter that's like, hey, we're covering this thing, and 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 understanding what those venues what they accept, what they take. Well, I'll say one more thing on that. Another thing, I, I, you know, that's like tablet is like a, a proper newspaper, but then also like 
people reviewing it like on their YouTube channel or on their, you know what I mean? There's plenty of small time reviewers and bloggers and things who are, who are like delighted to get a copy if you want to send them a copy or whatever, like, you know, willing to, or even like write-ups of like they played it at a con and like they're posting about it. So I don't know, Jay, do you have thoughts about how to attract that kind of attention and yeah. coverage? Um, so I think that the, um, a lot of that is organic. It's getting to yeah. know people. It's connecting with um, publisher. It's connecting, sorry, it's connecting with press. It's like going out and like finding uh, various folks. Like you meet them at cons, you'll find them in spaces, you'll see them online, you know. Um, getting press emails, like getting the emails of people in press and sending them a little thing like the month before your game is going to drop is like a great thing to do. Um, press is one of those things that takes time to build up the practice and skill on and like to build up the connections. So like, don't sweat it for your first one. If you don't have the brain, the bandwidth or the space for that, you don't have to. As you continue to release stuff, you will get more and more familiar with finding those connection spots and making those, you know, inroads and like marketing in those ways. Um, but I generally consider that to be like, a, it's like a, it's like a thing that if you are the kind of person who loves, uh, you know, reach, you know, networking and connecting with, you know, that sort of world. And like the same thing is true for influencers, right? Like, you know, if you're the kind of person who loves the world of influencers and like sent that whole thing, that's that. Um, but don't don't beat yourself up about trying to do it if it's not your forte. That's the sort of thing that can also come naturally mm -hmm. over time. Yeah. All right, what else you got? Yeah, hold on. I'm going back to our list of questions. Okay. Um, do you guys have any specifically that we haven't covered yet that you want to bring up? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a couple of just like this or that, like logistical, what would you prefer to use oh, yeah. things? If we would just want yeah, to run sure. through those Let's... quickly. Um, digital yeah. marketplaces, HIO, like other forms, where do we post things if we don't have our own website? Uh, HIO is the best place right now. Uh, it's super, like they let you control the amount that they get paid. They give you the best rates. Um, drive through RPG is better if your thing looks more like Dungeons and Dragons. The more it looks like that, the better it'll do on drive through. Um, but itch.io is better if you're making actually new cool stuff. <laughs> um, and the cooler and newer your thing is, the the more itch.io is a good home for it. Yeah. Um, crowdfunding wise, uh, Jay Possum Creek Games has been going to Indiegogo. For us, is it does it matter? Is it Kickstarter? Is it Indiegogo? What's the? If your goal is to maximize making money, Kickstarter is still the best place to be. Um, it is the only place I can in full confidence feel okay about recommending to someone who is starting out. Um, I, every single other option has like several asterisks next to it. And I would feel <laughs> weird about telling, like, I couldn't, I couldn't in full confidence be like, you gotta go to this place without being like, just as a warning about this. <laughs> uh, Backer kit would be the only other place where I'd even be like, I think you should try this, but they're also not in open right now. They're still in beta. So that's, okay. you know, that's the kind of thing. But like, I think Kickstarter, if you're, if you have moral reservations around what Kickstarter has been up to, which like they've, they've reversed course on a lot of the stuff I was really frustrated with them about last year. Um, if you still have moral reservations, then you know, yeah, uh, don't, you know, like then, then follow your, your moral heart, but like, know that that's kind of the, is that the why, so why, why is, why, why did, why is Possum Creek signed Indiegogo? Is that largely because of the, like to take a stand about, or yeah, is it, and it at a different scale, it's easier to manage? It's easier to take the hit to your finances in the name of your morality when your finances are in general coming from a larger pool. Right. We we made the call. And like I do know from the back end that Possum Creek's decision to do that was really impactful in terms of Kickstarter's choice to not do, you know, blockchain technology for their stuff, like to drop all that. Mm -hmm. Like we had a major impact on that, mm -hmm. but we could have a major impact because we already had the capital. Whereas if mm -hmm. you're not in the spot to make that call, you I can't tell you to do that yeah. indiegogo yeah. was an experiment i don't know if i can i don't want to 
badmouth them on online, <laughs> but I don't know. I can't in full conscious recommend it to, you know, to newer folks. Yeah. Um, Do I have other specific uh, this or that questions? Um, I don't think so. I think those were our two, yeah. like, I feel like everything pretty much got covered. Amazing. Um, cool. Yeah, which is awesome. That's good. <laughs> well, it's just, uh, you know, we're just coming right down to two hours. So, like, yeah. Perfect. amazing really efficiency. Pretty great. Wow. Pretty great. Yeah, killer. That's cool. amazing. Yeah. So, what are, what are, so maybe give us a quick feedback. Like, after you've done, having heard all that, like, was anything super surprising? Is there anything, like, what do you, do you feel more empowered going forward? Was there anything where you're like, oh, crap, this, we got to rethink this? Like, you know, any anything, uh, what's your take? Having um, just, like, the budget broken down was, like, so helpful. <laughs> Appreciate that hugely. <laughs> It's a it's a party trick at really boring and weird parties. For <laughs> <laughs> One thing that like surprised me, but I think is like really helpful moving forward with our direction is like to not just go straight to PDF. Because like, I mean, in my mind, I was like, oh, well, that's probably the easiest way that we could, you know, go about self-publishing. But if that could take a hit to potential physical sale, then like and you know, I think that's what we want to pursue. I, I'd be, I'd love to have our book in our hands. Uh, then it's, yeah. it's helpful having that, uh, that knowledge to not just jump right into PDF sales. Yeah. I mean, in general, just, you know, having this chance to talk with two big figures uh, in, in the industry and like, you know, getting to have that separate perspective on it. Cause we're a bunch of kids trying to make a game <laughs> and, you know, like, yeah, for kids trying to do things at one point, uh, seeing like how where the line is to go from you know like where we are to somewhere in the future. It was really just like you know good to be able to get that that point of view on it. Yeah, this is just in general so hugely appreciated that you guys were like willing to have this chat with us and help us out. <laughs> sure thing, sure thing. That's awesome. So yeah, the other thing to say is you're on this podcast and. We do have show notes, and so if you have something up somewhere, you should probably, probably yeah. a little while before this ships, you should probably put up like some Squarespace page or something, or or at least a Twitter account or a, whatever yeah. it is, so we can uh, say Hollyhock, go check it out. <laughs> yeah, well, currently we have a we have a link tree, so if we want to put that in, then we can do. Yeah. We'll add things to our link tree as things go. Uh, I mean, one good thing, another good thing worth saying is to have a mailing list, just to have a place when people are interested yeah. to be like, yeah, sign up for our mailing list. We'll let you know. Like we, even if we don't have anything yet, but you know, we'll keep you posted. Like that can be yeah. useful. Um, what we do have currently active and going, we've got a Discord server. We have a bunch of, I think we have like 70-ish oh, yeah. people right now. Um, so it's cool. small, but growing. Um, yeah. So I mean, that's, that's our big thing. We're starting up uh, Instagram, Twitter. We have a Tumblr. Um, I'm sending the link tree and the there you chat. go link tr cool. e darius will will stick them in there um and let's make sure we have uh yeah actually also while we're wrapping up so we're at time but i but uh thanks so much for being on and jay thank you for coming and jay what do you want to tell the people about what what, what what what's coming out from possible greek games what do you want to uh what do you want to promote um, let the people know they want to know I feel so weird. This is not my this is not my promotional spot. I don't, I don't wanna, I, wanna, um, I know, but no. we wanna know. <laughs> sure. Um Possum Week Games are releasing the digital version of Yaseba's Bed and Breakfast later this month. So if you want to pick nice. up the, the PDF version and also our collaboration with the VTT, you can check that out. Um we're also announcing something really cool in like a week that I can't like commit to recording, but do like see if we've announced something cool, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, I you know, we probably won't NDA. ship this for a week. So you could <laughs> like it's, it takes us usually longer than a week to get the podcast out. Yeah. So you could tell us and then we could all That's be true, quiet you, yeah, about it. Until... Tell you what, you're breaking you're breaking the rules. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but we are we are collaborating with um, Hunter Entertainment on a uh, project on a project for Alice is Missing that's oh, going to wow. be uh, a 
uh, like a, a it's going to be like a, a a hack of it, kind of like Dream Apart was for Dream Askew, but wow, uh, for cool. Alice in Essence, it's going to be a, about ghost stories and campfire stories. That'll be really cool. Wow, so very amazing. Exciting. We will definitely yeah. play that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, we love Alice Wesley. We love all your work. So yes. yes We're absolutely. currently so, playing Sleepaway. So <laughs> wonderful. I'm so glad. It's so great. Um I, and yeah, I think also I guess specifically if you like my thoughts, because I did say a lot of thoughts here, you should support the Possum Creek Patreon patreon.com slash possum creek the creekside community center which is like the associated discord is genuinely my favorite design space and like that's not just because everyone in there is like backing the patreon but like <laughs> it is truly like there's a lot of really great designers doing cool stuff in there and it feels like a really good environment and it is kind of my like if you've got a dollar a month to spare if you've got 10 bucks a year to spare it's really worth it um and like i would be saying that even if i wasn't uh if even if it wasn't my space you know so do 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 check that out if you can and i post like good thoughts and stuff so all yeah. right well thanks everybody for coming this was terrific i can't wait to see what happens keep us posted yep uh yeah yeah thank Sounds you so much thank yeah you. thanks for doing thank this you so much thank sure you all. thing take care until next yep. time, stay human, I guess. <laughs> Is that your sign off? <laughs> Great catchphrase. I sign off. It's, it's a thought. I mean, it's, 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 it's we're very confident, confident in it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think the whole joke is that it's a science fiction podcast. So we're like, human, what is that? Are, are all our listeners? <laughs> we we await we, the day when not we all did, our We did never human. figure uh, out if the four of us are one or more humans. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. I, or, yes. or a, or a <laughs> like transcendent entity. I, I feel like there's that. I think that trope is dimmed down a little bit there. You know, the, the, the like, the like, you know, next generation of humanity hive mind like <laughs> trope. It's, it's i feel like that could be it's because we've already encountered the next generation of humanity as a hive mind they're yeah. called tiktok stands and <laughs> these horrifying, like not very functional things so it's we're a separate hive mind than that yeah. <laughs> distance ourselves you're, you're an old school hive mind <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Play has games theodore that. sturgeon yeah <laughs> Currently. Golden age hive mind. Stay <laughs> human, I guess. <laughs> Stay hive mind? Stay hive mind. Stay hive mind. Stay hive mind. <laughs> <laughs>